so lovely to see uh, a packed audience for this very fantastic talk. So my name is Sarah McKinnon, and I'm a, an associate professor in the Department of Communication Arts. And it is really my honor to be here to introduce um, Dr. Shanara Reed Brinkley, who's currently a visiting scholar in the Humanities Center at the University of Pittsburgh. I have known Professor Reed Brinkley for more than a decade, which is mind-blowing. I was just thinking about that. Um, Since graduate school. Yeah, I was thinking about it this morning. And I was trying to narrow down to the time when we met each other. And I think I narrowed it down to a panel session that we both attended um, where Patricia Hill Collins was speaking. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Do and not at the me. end of this talk, oh, my God, I cannot believe you. Professor <laughs> Reed Brinkley stands up like, I think, the first question. I'm a graduate student. Right, we're both going. graduate students at the time. And proceeded to tell uh, Patricia Hill Collins not to worry about retiring. Um, because there was a bundle of up-and-coming black women ready to take her place and to pick off where to pick up off where she left off. I didn't mean it like that. I know, but it, that's, that's, it was fantastic, and I was like, okay, we have to know each other. <laughs> anyway, be friends. So as we will learn from her talk today, her research is at the intersections of rhetorical studies, which is my field, African American study, studies, um, gender and sexuality studies, as well as urban studies. She specializes in examining race and gender in public address and advocacy, as well as media. And in addition to being a practitioner and teacher of de debate and other forms of public deliberation, she also theorizes it. So in her current book project, Black, uh, young Black and Political, Radical Activism, Argument Culture, and Civil Society, she examines Black youth politics and activism in an educational context. The central questions of this text are, how do Black youth discuss race-centered political questions? And what kinds of rhetorical and bodily performances do they utilize to engage public in argument? In addition to learning about black, black youth culture, especially in the current generation of millennials, um, Professor Reed Brinkley's work also offers insights into how to create arguments <coughs> and communicative forms that cut through political echo chambers, refuse respectability politics, and speak differently to different audiences. In her talk for today, entitled Black Radical Rhetorics, a Case Study in Black Youth Activism, we're going to learn about how one community of black youth activists, those doing competitive debate in college and high schools across the United States, have begun to do that. This work has really deep implications for competitive um, debate publics, but it's also instructive to general publics about how to make change in institutions, in particular in institutions that seem completely closed off and completely exclusive. So please join me in welcoming Professor Reed Brinkley. Okay. Um, so I want to do a quick review of just what my talk was yesterday since we have such a large group who is uh, new to this research. And it, the talk for today doesn't depend on you having seen the first talk, but if you did, you'll get a lot more out of sort of what I'm doing theoretically as an academic and how I'm using theory to study material circumstances of black radical activism amongst black youth. So part of, I'm going to read a little bit here that sort of describes um, a little bit about debate and what sort of the problems are when one is uh, black and acts black in uh, interracial situations. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit about that. And I'm going to do a little bit of some of the talk that I did on Afro-pessimism from the first day. So those of you who have heard it before, please bear with me. But I want to sort of get you all uh, on board with sort of where the research is going and then how I'm reading this particular case study as a result of that. Can we do that? Is that fine? Okay. So racially different bodies must perform that difference according to the cultural norms of the debate community. For black students, it can often mean changing their appearance, standardizing language practices, and eschewing their cultural practices. In essence, in order to have an opportunity for achieving in debate competitions, black students must performatively whiten. Acting black is problematic because those performative identities are not recognizable in the normative frame of debate practice. In fact, blackness signifies a difference, an opposite, a negative differential. It is not that the debate community explicitly operates to exclude based on race. Rather, it competitively rejects black presence or normative non-white performance. 
It is, the it is the combination of cultural values, behavioral practices, and the significance of black f flesh that produce barriers to meaningful, in meaningful participation. So I use a lot of theory from, uh, from a tradition of black studies called Afro-pessimism. Um, and they sort of build their work on Franz Fanon, and they sort of build from there. And so they've been writing in the last five or 10 years or so, building a body of scholarship that the goal is to move beyond a study of racism, because the term racism in a lot of ways still connotes prejudice to people, you know what I mean? So there's a distinction between prejudice and racism. Racism is about systems of power, right? Prejudice is about your personal attitude. But it's very difficult to get people to understand those distinctions, so when you say something is racist, uh, people assume that means that you're talking about them as an individual, their performance towards you, and what you're really talking about is a structure of racism. And so the Afro-pessimists are trying trying to move us away from the language of racism to the study of anti-blackness. And so when they say racism, they will often put anti-black racism before the term racism. And part of the reason they're doing that is because the advent of multiculturalism in our country and our interest in diversity, uh, often a lot of times that displaces a direct confrontation with the issue of black racism, anti-black racism, how racism functions for black people. And what the Afro-pessimists want to argue is not that other kinds of racism are not important, but that there is something very unique about anti-black racism and its relationship to the constitutive nature of US civil society and the US state government. So I'm going to read a little bit just here so you get some of the language that I'm trying to sort of play with and a very basic understanding of what Afro-pessimism is trying to do. And then we'll move into the current talk for today. For Afro-pessimists, the group of black scholars who have popularized the study of anti-blackness, the black is juxtaposed against what it means to be master, human, citizen, and subject in a manner that is constitutive of U.S. civil society. The U.S. is built upon a notion of freedom and liberty that necessitated the negative dialectic of the slave to define the parameters of the nation state. This foundational relationship has sutured together U.S. civil society and continues to do so. For theorist Frank Wilderson, the grammar of black slave suffering is marked by accumulation and fungibility, a relation of being owned and traded. The human's white grammar of suffering is marked by alienation and exploitation. The grammar of black slave suffering is not recognizable within the frame of human white suffering. It can only be misrecognized as alienation and exploitation. For the study of rhetoric, an understanding of the political ontology of the black is one that is necessarily defined by its status as slave object, requires that we engage the question of whether or not the black has the capacity for recognition in the construction of the moment of speaking voice. Watts would agree that the black does not have speech. That is why the production of voice is only a momentary process, a happening by which blacks can seek recognition. For the black, the body announces itself prior to speech. So it follows that the black lacks capacity for speech because they approach the speaking moment as a non-recognizable subject and positioned as incapacity by the modalities of accumulation and fungibility. For Afro-pessimists, Capacity is made coherent in civil society by a necessary relationship to black incapacity. Wilderson notes that, quote, white human capacity in advance of the event of discrimination or oppression is parasitic on black incapacity. Without the Negro, capacity itself is incoherent, uncertain at best, end quote. Not only does the black lack the same capacity as the white in first approaching the speaking situation, she, he enters the situation as incapacity. The black must battle with its political ontological condition as a precursor to the process of speaking, let alone the production of voice. So that's where I am theoretically. I'm a rhetorician, I study rhetoric, and I started the talk the first day in attempting to sort of get us to think about racial, like del public deliberation in a context around race where the, where the situation is interracial. So when we're attempting to talk about race in interracial context, there's always conflict. And it, often many people walk away from those situations feeling like they're not understood or their perspective isn't understood. And I've watched for 10 years this sort of movement of black students in a majority white activity like college policy debate struggle to get white people to hear what they are saying. 
And what I fundamentally began to realize is that it's not that white people don't have empathy when people of color are speaking about the experience of discrimination or oppression. The problem is that there is no grammar of suffering for black suffering that can compute in a context where white suffering is the foundation for understanding empathy. That's the problem. So we can't talk to each other about black suffering because black suffering makes no sense in the context of white suffering. It has no value in that context. And thus when we try to communicate about it, white people cannot hear us. And that is what we are sort of battling against. I'm not sure rhetoric can fix that problem. I'm not sure we can communicate or speak our way out of this situation. So for the Afro-pessimists, they fundamentally agree that that's true. We're not going to speak ourselves out of anti-blackness. What they argue is that we'll need a fundamental collapse of American civil society to restructure it so that it is not constituted by the foundational and historical relation between the slave and the master. Because we keep reproducing it, which is why we still have a problem with racism today. Okay, so that's sort of where I am theoretically as a scholar. What I want to do today, um, especially for those of you who were here yesterday, is give you a really good example of a case study where I'm looking at an interracial context that is majority white, where black students have decided that they are going to question the structure and form of the educational practice and process that they participate in. And what they decided was that not all education matched people's cultural backgrounds and not all education is useful for everybody. And so they've changed the debate community over the past 10 years. When I was a debater, I was a young debater at the high school level and I was on a debate team that became the pilot program for a larger urban debate league program that has gone national. There are more than 22 to 24 cities in the country that now house urban debate leagues. And I was in that first generation of pilot programs. So my high school integrated the all white Georgia high school circuit and we were very good at it. And so as a result, this nonprofit program came through with millions of dollars to start urban debate around the country. And what began to happen is as these students matriculated through high school and started going to college, and so of course these majority white universities want to recruit these students of color. There's a ready pool, right, a diverse pool of debaters that they can go tap to bring into college debate. But once they brought those students into college debate, they were persistently losing. They were not successful. The atmosphere was toxic for <coughs> black students because they were such a minor minority. And the concerns, the political issues that they were concerned with as African Americans were ignored ignored in that context. And so it really was a difficult situation for many black debaters who chose to go to college and we found it very difficult to retain them. And so a group of college students who had gotten recruited as a class, a cohort, so one black professor at a university, the University of Louisville, started the Malcolm X debate program. He renamed his debate program and committed himself to recruiting African American students. He recruited debaters who had previous experience, but he also recruited out of his hip hop class. Right, his campus hip hop class, undergraduate class. And so he brought all of these black students onto the debate team. So they were traveling 15 to 20 debaters. That's a very large debate team. But because they were traveling together and he had built them into a cohort, they started strategizing about how to approach not just being successful in debate competition, but how to approach the structural racism of the community itself. And so what they started at this one u small university has now expanded to multiple college debate teams around the country and has taken over the high school circuit. So in just the past three weeks, I've just traveled back from Kansas after the two national championships for policy debate. One of those championships called CETA Nationals, which you'll hear me mention in the talk, is called the People's Tournament. It means that you don't have to qualify to attend, it's usually a very large tournament, anywhere from 200 to 300 teams, and most people can most people can gather and come, even if you just do regional debate on a normal scale. But there's a second championship tournament, which is the elite tournament. It's called the national debate tournament. The national debate tournament almost was completely white. My first tournament in college, I went to a national debate tournament. Um, tournament. It's called the National Debate Tournament tournament, right? Um, so I went to that tournament uh, my first semester and it was held at uh, the University of Kentucky and that experience was so traumatic for me 
that I quit debating that year and my debate coach had to like work on me for a year to convince me to come back and participate. But I was at tournaments where I was one of three black people and the only black woman out of hundreds of white people. It was an uncomfortable environment. So that's the environment that a lot of students were sort of existing in. And so now what we have, just got back from Kansas, see the Nationals and the NDT. We, for the second time in the last five years, we've had an all black team win both of those tournaments. Now before that black team won it in 2012, it had never been won by a black person in its more than 70 year history. Right, so they broke the record the first time. Now the guy, one of the guys who was on that championship team went on to coach a team after he graduated from college and that team just won CETA Nationals and the NDT. Now, no white team in the history of debate has ever won both tournaments in the first year, but this is the second time that a black team has won both tournaments in the same year. They are taking over the activity, right? So what I want to show you is a little video so you get an idea of what competitive debate practice looks like. Now I'm showing you a video from 2004, which is when this Louisville team that becomes the ones that sort of make this kind of argument style popular and significant. It's their senior year. They had spent three years as competitive policy debaters losing more than they ever won. And all hell breaks loose their senior year and the amazingness starts to happen and they're winning and these white people are like, what is happening? Why, is, why are these black people winning? Like playing hip hop music, doing some spoken word, like what is happening here? So this has caused a large conflict in the community. We call it the clash of civilizations. That's how serious it is, right? Like it's real deep. Like friendships have broken up. Screaming matches at tournament. I've been in trouble myself. I got caught on video in an argument with this white man at a tournament who verbally attacked me after a debate round and that ended up on Fox News Network. Bill O'Reilly talked about it because got somebody posted it to YouTube. You know Bill O'Reilly like doing anything that can embarrass either academics or black people. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? So this is a contentious situation, right? So I want to give you an idea of what it looked like in 2004 because as white as it looks in this video to you besides the Louisville team, when you see black people generally that's Louisville, right? So to give you a contrast of how white debate was and what Louisville was doing to now understand that I go to tournaments and there are days that I just sort of look out in the crowd of debaters and I have tears in my eyes because I remember what it meant to be the only one. And now I have coached an entire generation of new black coaches. We go out to brunch for, at every tournament. We, get, we make the, the tab room give us off round six. All the black coaches get together. And now we go to a restaurant. We have to call ahead because there are too many of us just to seat without knowledge. And I look around at that and I am amazed. Right, that we have built an entire tradition of meaningful black debate practice in less than 10 years. Okay, all right, so let's watch some video. Ready to go to work. 58th National Debate Tournament, round the third. Permanent Berkeley guest guests, negative, Emory, Delta. Uh, debaters have, to, have some facility because they have to debate both sides of the question. Sometimes they're affirmative where they support a resolution, sometimes they're negative, where they argue that the affirmative is not correct. You'll take half and half in a tournament, so you'll have each side. All teams are beginning their journey, eight debates in three days. To advance to the single elimination rounds, teams must win five of those eight debates. So, Ariel, uniqueness evidence, however, there doesn't need to be uniqueness of the link argument, which is according to... Or as Molly Cotton promised, Lobodon Bodhi Tiaki has notes when it comes to trade, you're totally forgotten. There's nothing to do with trade. In debate, evidence can be called from a front page story. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's right.
and that's true for every debater within the room. Yeah, don't stand there. The government's the problem is that too many Iraqis have been the U.S. back to a transitional government that says okay, it's an investigation, it's a violation, they do not specify we wouldn't miss plan. These are point standards, one ground failing, specify pressure, domestic disadvantages, kind of plans, these key negative strategies, too. The government's argument says circumscribe everything everybody says first. The U.S. does not intervene for good, nice reasons. But now from the boss, which means that if we win the world, then well, but the other plan is worse vis a vis the status quo. First off, case politics is giving school to school to be able to the FH 22. The National Collegiate Debate Championship is 58 years old. Over all that time, the speed of the debaters has dramatically increased. They go anywhere between 350 to 400, sometimes more than 400 words. There's a reason why they want to speak that quickly within the debate. It really comes down to the faster you can speak, the more arguments you can present within your speech. If you can pack more arguments in and more words within that amount of time, there's that much more that your opponent has to answer and respond to. Debaters' distinctive styles extend from their speeches to their quirky mannerisms. Like snowflakes, each debater is unique. <laughs> debaters, while they're listening to it at that best rate of speed, they're not only thinking about that, they're developing their next speech and writing it in their own mind. Um, so that's what's really kind of mind-boggling, is that it gets to the point that they're thinking even faster than that rate. Then there's Louisville, whose debaters have a totally different approach to the competition. They don't speak 400 words a minute, they use rap music as evidence, and it often seems they're playing an entirely different game. Let me captivate your mind. Sit back and unwind. Let your consciousness find a call or path. In this worldwide bloodbath of wars, destruction, no freedom, no peace. Police still shooting us dead in the street. And I'm the one to make it out of the We made a decision to put the cards down and stop reading the evidence in traditional ways. And once we did that, and we put that with the rap music, and then the final piece that was missing was our personal experiences. We began to question the ways that other teams introduce knowledge. Without these things to, to increase motivation for these kids to be here today, to learn how they can debate and gain the education that we have in my four years in debate and also how we can learn from these kids, then we will never put things in practice. That's why diversity is never going to change in this community. Play dead prayers. The non-traditional approach of Louisville is still contained in the rigid format of each debate. After each speech, there is a three-minute cross-examination where each team challenges the other's arguments. Sometimes they get a little heated. It will promote self-determination conflicts, and then your impact evidence says that we unnaturally respond to those by new So our argument, your argument is that the time frame on this is... A, a policy that could happen sometime next year. Uh, no, actually, I think that the collapse of the reform process in the short term would still have an effect on consumers. Well, okay, then what's, 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 what kind of reform is happening in the short term? Your argument is predicated on the counterfactual claim. What if we did nothing about it? We can advance in front of a bunch of Nazis and say, I'm going to be non-violent, non-violent. Yeah. After this hour and a half long process, roughly hour and a half, maybe a little bit longer, then there's time that the judge starts to decide. And they'll look at a number of different things. They'll look over their notes from the debate, and they'll also ask for evidence that the affirmative or the negative team might have read during the debate. There's certainly a mix of how eloquent and persuasive the speaker was, but there's more of a focus upon the, the quality of the research and how well the argument is constructed. Uh, the decision is a 2-1 for the affirmative, Harvard. The decision is a 3-0 for the negative for Michigan State. Decision is a 2-1 for the University of Louisville. To give a fair All right, I'm going to stop it there. You all get a sense, sort of, of what the tournament looks like. Um, and so you can also imagine, like, when I walked in as an 18-year-old straight out of, you know, ATL Georgia to the college circuit, and this is sort of what it looks like and it feels like. And you, I don't, if you don't do debate, you can't imagine the tension, right? Like, if you ever played sports or did something competitively where you, like, you were really serious at it, this is that thing for these kind of people, right? This is like nerd football, right? Like, it's like, 
we have things like the Sweet 16 or like the Top 16. We call them the Sweet 16. So you get ranked at, in the nation. The Top 16 of those are called our Sweet 16. And then they're in the running for who is the top team overall at the end of the year. There are two national tournaments. Like teams battle it out. Like when people lose their senior year at these national championships, like I've watched people freak out like start throwing things crying like it's real you know what I mean like it's like a real sport you're like exhausted at the end of the day like you just played like you know three championship you know basketball tournament rounds like it is exhausting and these people take it incredibly seriously and you saw some of the schools that participate right there are some big Ivy League schools that pay a lot of money for it to win these kinds of championships and in addition to that things like the winner of the of the um, there's a person who went at the National Debate Tournament Championship who gets announced who gets an internship to the CSIS uh, organization in DC and they do some kind of you know like strategic studies military army kind of whatnot right people like uh, Carl Rove were former debaters like debaters end up in some crazy powerful situations um, like I can't tell you the number of lawyers that I know like very well off lawyers because that's what debate produces. It produces lawyers, it produces uh, professors, it produces people who are politicians, it produces people who do research for political think tanks. So this is a very significant population of students and this conflict has very much so caused, it caused a very significant fracture in the community itself. So as an alternative, so that was 2004. As an alternative, I want to show you some video footage of some debaters from around 2011 or so. Um, and so this is, so that's um, 9, 10, so that's like seven years after Louisville's very strong showing in the 2003-2004 season. Um, and it's about three years after the first all-black team wins the CETA Nationals debate tournament, um, which is the first time in the history of that tournament that an all-black team had won as well. So that was 2008. So this is the next generation, right? So we've gone from the Louisville original generation and then from Louisville it spread to Towson University at Baltimore. It's the Towson team that wins the championship in 2008. And then by the time we get past 2008, it's starting to spread to other teams around the country. So I'm gonna show you video images of a Towson debater, so one of the next generation of Towson debaters, but also an image from a debater from Emporia State University in Emporia, Kansas, uh, who was recruited out of the debate Kansas, Kansas City Urban Debate League as a freshman and attended um, Emporia. What I want you to note is that these two speeches are actually happening in the same debate round. And so the, t the, sh the, the speech that I'm going to show first is um, an affirmative speech where the affirmative is arguing that we need to, the, the topic that year is about democracy assistance and democracy promotion by the United States federal government. The affirmative argues that uh, we do need democracy assistance and democracy promotion, but we need that at home because Americans don't really know what democracy is, which is why we keep engaging in imperialist and colonialist actions towards other nations. And so their argument is they sort of use the topic as a jumping off point for their argument, which is we need to be having these discussions about what we're doing at home. Whereas the negative team in this debate, which Towson represents, their argument is that as black people, we need to stop trying to prop up democracy in the United States because democracy is a part of that which constitutes U.S. civil society and the state that is bound by a necessary relationship to the black as slaves. So they're using the Afro-pessimism argument that I started to talk about at the top of the speech. But they are doing this by, and I'm just showing you the introduction to each of these speeches, but their introductions are battling spoken word hip-hop pieces that bring together the theoretical argument that they're making, these students are very real, well read. So don't assume because they use them, they talking in rhyme, that they're not making arguments, mm -hmm. right? And so this is how this process starts to evolve. The students start bringing together the theorists and the history, the context, and learning to put to, that together in mobile messages that are, that you know, anybody can listen to, but are also about training themselves to be able to speak politically to their own communities, to motivate change and action in their own communities, and not always be considered concerned about what white people think. Um, so this is a really good example, I think, of a debate round where you're going to get those battling sort of perspectives. What's also important to realize is that the Emporia team 
their perspective on democracy is one that represents their perspective on the political, on politics and what black people should be doing politically, just as Towson's argument sort of represents what they think we should be doing politically. So even simultaneously as these debaters are engaged in arguments about the debate topic, they are also arguing about the future of black radical resistance. Right? That's the conversation they're trying to have with each other. Okay. So we're going to look at um, the affirmative first. They say we in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So when my black skin can be bound from the cradle of the gray. Sitting back and being quiet because they told me to behave, but I was about to scream. That's so loud. Y'all got to listen close. Change. You said the right foot of me daily. Show me where are my fangs. We get ahead, but there's no coverage. Tell me where are my bangs. From slang to proper speak, from mess to proper keep, I envision that far I seek true democracy. And every sense of every meaning in the context of the word, you feel like it now, but it works more like a verb. Living, being, thriving, being, all hope left, clinging to this monstrous machine we call democracy. And this machine that seemingly seeks to just ignore you. Even at the times when it just can't afford to, two sides to every story, so I pledge my allegiance to adding more too. Pay no attention to load of promises because I'm broke and I can't afford you. It's like a 4-2 and my freedom's being touted on the street right before me. I don't speak out so folk can applaud, praise, love, or adore me. I'm still keeping a watch over the space turned off about a one two come before me. And to the ones who come after to write the next chapter, if it's not a revolution, then it just don't matter. We need a classroom to practice <laughs> democracy now. Okay, so that's Toya's speech. Toya is now currently the director of debate at CSU Fullerton. Mm -hmm. The nigga from the corner who's mission to go to college position to be a scholar still relegated to squalor. The object of your oppression objectifies his conceptions in college to gain knowledge in white spaces and stepped in. Pop, knock, knock on the door, but never let in. Fiasco, we let the get go. A little weapon against deception. Don't accept the misconceptions. The world was superimposed on my progression. Resolutions, solutions, drenched in illusions, delusions of institutions, of slave blood running through them. Whiteness over black, righteousness and crack. At the right state, they try to signify his back. The human location can't put us on the map. I pull heaven from the sky to bring your world to the trap. Heaven and the hell was slavery to jail. Then the brain of me is criminal. Camera by me bail. Your world is in jail, and we are Jonathan Jackson. Death is inevitable, and suicide is action. The only education that is not possible in this configuration is a uh, education towards total revolution. All right. Okay. So you see the sort of different perspectives that they're taking on what black political resistance should look like. You can turn the lights on. Let me finish. With you. So this is an example of sort of what debaters are attempting to do. I want to talk a little bit. I was going to try to read this manuscript, but I think I'm just going to. We're just going to do this extemporaneously together because we're going to run out of time. So what I want to talk about uh, really quickly. Let's see. Is Louisville's contribution contribution to debate? this in the view world. Okay, so what's Louisville's contribution to debate? You got me on the camera. Okay, good. So Louisville does a number of things. One of the things that you noted in the videotape was how quickly the debaters were speaking, right? And so they noted that debaters speak about 350 to 400 words per minute. Now that's really important because what that means is you can't really attend debate tournaments to listen to the arguments they're making about politics unless you're trained in policy debate yourself because you cannot hear it, right? And they're not giving you the paper copy, right, of what they're saying. So judges are not looking at the paper copy in these debates, right? They are just writing down what the debaters are saying, but they've been do they did it as a competitor and now they're judging so they can hear this. Like I can hear what they're saying, right? I can take notes on what it is that they're saying, but I had to be trained in debate for years to be able to listen to people speak at that speed, which means that tournaments don't have audiences. <laughs> 
right? Tur debate tournaments don't have audiences. So they're in there, and they really are making some really complicated, thoughtful arguments about U.S. foreign policy or U.S. domestic policy. They're talking about U.S. economics. They're talking about our nuclear weapons stockpile. They're talking about our relationships to Russia, to China, to the Middle East, right? Debate topics are designed to force very specific discussions about U.S. policy. So those are those debaters who also go on to do amazing things. They become politicians. They become researchers for political think tanks. You would think it would be awesome for people, for the public, to have access to this kind of level of debate about American policy. But because it's at the speed that it is, no one comes to watch debaters talk at debate tournaments. So you're just talking to the other team and the judges in the room, right? That's what. That's who's listening to your awesome ideas about American politics, right? <laughs> Um, so they critique the speed of debate because for Louisville, their argument is we need to be trained to speak not just to political elites, but we need to be able to speak to our own communities about political issues that are facing the nation. And going in there with the sort of slavish devotion you have to this sort of speaking very fast, and, and debaters have to sort of that has to wear off after you stop debating, right? So like debaters are often accused when they're speaking publicly that they're speaking too fast. Like I speak really fast and I have to take very few breaths but it's because my body is trained to speak at this speed and this sounds slow to me. So I am thinking, <laughs> like, you know what I mean, really. So like I am thinking, you know, 30, 40 seconds ahead in my head of what I want to say compared to what I'm actually saying to you. That's what this kind of speed does, and it's useful. It means that you know, you're know you never gonna ask me a question that I can't answer immediately upon you stop, you not speaking anymore, right? Because I've already figured out where your question is going by hearing the first six or seven words of it, right? And I've already started to formulate my answer to it as you are still speaking the end of it. <laughs> because debate forces you to train to listen to ideas that fast and be responsive that quickly. So Louisville thought, it's really important that the skills that we are learning and that the kinds of debates that we are having be available for other people to come and listen to because we're not just here to play this game with you people. Like We have communities that we are concerned about that we're trying to train ourselves to be advocates for. So they critique this sort of use of speed. They also critique this sort of slavish devotion to expert evidence. So expert evidence is something that sort of distinguishes policy debate from other forms of debate. There are other kinds of debates in, in debate competition in the United States, but most of them are not as evidence heavy and do not speak as fast as policy debate. Policy debate is considered the elite of the debate activity. It's the granddaddy of debate, right? It's the oldest, it's the most significant. You know, we produce students who do amazing things. We're also very snooty about policy debate in comparison to other forms of debate. So like if you mention another, if you did, if you meet a policy debater and you mention that you were a debater in high school, they're gonna be like, oh really? And then you're gonna say, yes, I was a Lincoln Douglas debater. They're gonna be like, oh. <laughs> That's not real debate, right? So really, right? So they're very snooty about it. And part of it is this sort of devotion to expert evidence. Debaters research in a year based on that topic a master's degree worth of information to prepare for tournaments, like literally, right? So they think of themselves as the best researchers, the best rational argumentative thinkers because they have to be able to justify every part of an argument that they make. And they have to justify it not just with their own words but with actual researched evidence. So one of the reasons why Louisville critiqued this use of expert evidence is because policy debate is so laser focused on expertise it means that they exclude other kinds of knowledge making or knowledge production from the space of debate competition itself. Which means that you, even if you have a personal story or knowledge about something that has to do with the actual debate topic that year, your personal knowledge is irrelevant. Your personal thoughts about it are irrelevant. Your personal ideas about it, nobody cares about because it's not about anything, any knowledge that you may bring to the activity. They only care what the experts say. Now here's why that matters. When you're talking about a topic like this past year, our topic was uh, climate change. So we talked about global warming um, and how climate change is affecting multiple populations. Well, the black coaches were arguing that 
you know, black people and people of color generally are at the very center of a topic on climate change, right? But let me just tell you how easy it was for the white students to avoid having to talk about people of color and climate change. It's like they, they, they walk around every piece of research that make them have to talk about people of color. <laughs> they find every way not to talk about people of color, right? So what we, they're interested in talking about is how global climate change affects the average American, which really means they're concerned about white futurity, right? How do we save white people, not how do we save people of color, these other nations around the world that are harmed by our consumption patterns. So that is the kind of you know, critique of this idea of expertise. So when we're studying climate change, I'm doing research and I'm looking for a variety of kind of evidence. So yes, I'm looking for what the experts who are experts at climate change are saying. I want to know what they think about you know, carbon tax and all of that. Like I want to know what they think about those things. But I also want to know what Black Lives Matter is writing about climate change. And I want to know what the movement for black lives is saying about climate change. And I want to know what artists out there are talking about climate change. Because all of that becomes fodder for building an argument when you do this kind of debate strategy that the black students are using. But what ends up happening with debate is that if you focus on expert evidence when you view the topic, what you're interested in is going to find out what the experts say we should do about climate change. And often those experts don't look like people like me, and so they're not as concerned about what we need to be doing for climate change when it comes to people of color in particular. And so if we only use expert evidence as the sort of marker of evaluating debate round, there's a whole population of people who sort of get x out of that conversation. That's the critique of the extreme use of expert evidence that the Louisville team is making. So they're not anti-expertise, right? But they think that expertise is a part of the knowledge making process, but is not the knowledge making process itself. Right, so yes, we need expert evidence, but we should also be looking at organic intellectuals, people who are theorizing about the context of politics on the ground in the communities themselves. We also need to be use, using things like personal experience and social location as a means of making argument, and that's part of what you heard me talk about at the beginning, which is the black doesn't get to enter the speaking situation without their race being announced before they ever speak a word. And the black students were trying to get the white students to understand that it's not just that our race announces itself before we speak, but yours does too. And it's because your race announces itself that you get easier access to the speaking moment than a student of color or a black person might. And so it's that level of understanding your own personal experience, your social location, how you are positioned in political conversation, and then how audiences are likely to read you because of that positioning. So your race, your gender, your class, your sexual performance, right matters in how in terms of how audiences read you and then what credibility they are willing to give you based on what it is that you're saying so louisville wanted to complicate this notion that we can engage in debates outside of our personal experience and identity everything that comes out of your mouth everything that you think right it is bound by your personal experience Right? You have a pair of glasses on. I use this to describe to my interpersonal communication students. You have rose-colored glasses on. You see the world from that perspective. That's your experience. That's your life. That's how you make sense of the world. That's how babies make sense of the world. Right? They take in new information and they compare it to old information to see what the connection is and then they start to file it away. So in the same way, what you pay attention to, what you think is important, what you choose to read, what college you go to, who you choose to interact with, and how people respond to you, all of that is very much so wrapped up in your identity. And your identity is marked by things like race, gender, class, sexuality, religion, et cetera. So that's sort of Louisville's critique of this use of, or this not the use of evidence, but the sort of strict adherence to expertise. The other thing that Louisville critiques and that is still critiqued uh, by black debaters even now is the critique of topic selection and focus. So the way that debate, the college debate community chooses topics every year uh, is that people write topic papers for things that they think would be a great topic for, uh, for the upcoming season. They publish those online. The debate community reads them. And then each individual college debate team gets a vote on which topic becomes a topic for that year. Now, one of the arguments that people 
make in debate rounds when they say, you know, this black stuff you're doing doesn't belong here because this isn't about this topic that has been chosen and we democratically chose this topic and so you should adhere to the democratically chosen topic. If you didn't want this topic, you didn't have to vote for it. That's just a stupid argument, right? If you are a minority, the way democracy works is that the majority rules. Mm -hmm. Right, so if the majority of the community is white and traditional debaters, what kind of topics do you think we're going to get? We're gonna get the kind of topics that they want to debate about, which means that we hardly ever have topics that cover or centralize issues of race, or even when you would think that the topic would centralize issues of race, the co debate community, the traditional debaters, the white debate community finds every way it can not to talk about it. So on an Africa topic, you would think you would have to talk about blackness as an issue. But you can talk about <laughs> Africa and avoid that conversation. And I watched an entire year of white debaters do it, right? You can have a topic like my, my senior year of college, one of the topics was, I mean, the topic that year was the United States federal government should change uh, Title VII of the United States Civil Rights Act uh, uh, based on race and or gender. So you could choose either of those or you could choose both. So that year was my sort of discovery of black feminism. I didn't know black feminism existed into my senior year of college because I just hadn't had the kind, that kind of coursework as an undergraduate. And one of my white uh, coaches from the Emory debate team came to me and said, hey, they wrote this topic so it says race and or gender, which means that you could do race and gender and there's this whole body of literature written by these cool black women about why that intersection between race and gender is important. And so that really was a great topic for me, right? It brought me a whole new literature base and I was killer on that topic. What were these white people gonna say to this little black girl talking about race and gender? And I was smart and very good at the game, right? So I won like, I think I had like a 96% win ratio on the affirmative that year because we were talking about black feminism. But you would be surprised that almost every other white team in the country chose to talk about gender, right? Avoided the race part of the topic completely. So this is where we are. And part of the reason why students avoid that part of the topic is because race is such an incredibly difficult conversation to have. And people, particularly those who are marked by white privilege, who feel that they have little experience with other cultures or cultures of color, particularly black culture, it discourages them from wanting to participate in that conversation because we are in an age of political correctness where you're worried you're going to say the wrong thing in front of people and that you will be judged for it. And so often white students won't speak or they choose arguments that will allow them not to have to speak directly about race. So what's happening now? We are 10 years into this sort of movement of black debate in college debate. And what is still a very common argument for college debaters who are white when they're debating uh, black students is to say to them that you are not a topical representation of this resolution which we have, which means that you don't meet the resolution. The resolution says you have to advocate that the United States federal government does this particular thing towards climate policy and private businesses. And you're up here talking about how the U.S. don't care about people of color. Well, thank you for that FYI. But debate competition and policy debate, the rules of this thing work like you need to be doing this USFG thing that you're not doing. Now they've been running this argument for like eight to ten years and it's become incredibly incredibly more difficult for them to win it in front of the college debate judging pool because the black debaters have spent the last ten years even training the white judges mm -hmm. right so the white judges have been listening to black debaters make these arguments over and over again for the last eight to ten years and having to look at the research like judges can look at research at the end of the debate that the debaters have used in the debate so they ask for that at the end of the debate so they're reading this research right that these students of color have brought into the debate and so now we've gotten to the point where the judging pool is very well educated on the arguments and so you're not just gonna get away with I don't think that belongs here because that's not real debate and that's not real civic education and education is really important and you're hurting our education by talking about this race stuff. And the, the coaches are, I mean the, the judges are just like no, 
that's just not a good argument, right? You have no answer to the fact that their argument is that your way of debating hurts the education of people of color, women, queers, trans people, and that it drives people out the activity, everybody except for white men with economic privilege. Right? And so now the judges are being persuaded by that argument. So the final round of the national debate tournament this year, which I told you was won by this black team, it's the second time in its history that it's been won by a black team, that team uh, was debating a majority white team, two white debaters from, um, I believe it's Northwest, no, Georgetown. So two white debaters from Georgetown. And the Georgetown debaters make their regular, we should do something with climate policy, the United States federal government should pass this policy to deal with private industry, whatever, whatever. They make that argument. But the negative team makes the argument that their traditional way of presenting debate arguments and their universal commitment as a team, right, over a period of time to locking out discussion of race issues, including by not ranking any black judge high enough on their preference sheets to be judged by black people. Now that's a common practice in debate. I went four years without being highly ranked enough as a judge to fulfill my obligation for judging at tournaments because the only teams that were ranking me high enough to get me were black teams, right? The white teams have made a structural decision to rank all black judges, all black judges below the 50% mark because if you rank us that low you are unlikely to ever have to be judged by a black person at a debate tournament. So there are col white college debaters who go to places like Georgetown, like Harvard, right, who have never been judged by a black person in four years of college debate. And they can structurally do it. And their preferences are not made public. So you can't even see. All you have to do, though, is track who's been judging them at tournaments mm -hmm. in the past, and you can see no black judge, 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 right? So this is the situation that students find themselves in. So when we're talking about topic selection, that's not a democratic process. We don't get any you know, input into how we should formulate or think about what topics we choose. None of that is part of what we get to do as a part of this, a part of this process. The other thing, last thing I want to talk about as an example of sort of what Louisville really does, which is important. They critique the sort of impact claims that get made in debate rounds. So debate rounds are all about talking about what would happen if the U.S. federal government did X. Right? So let's say the United States federal government decided that it wanted to provide military assistance to Indonesia. And military assistance in that case just means we want to put one of our bases there or we want some military personnel or whatever. Right? So we're going to put some you know, military personnel um, at a new base in Indonesia. China is going to freak out. Right? That's what the other team says. Like, no, that's a bad idea. We should not put those people in Indonesia because China is going to get really upset and then we're going to have conflict over with them or our relations are already shaky because we have conflict over Taiwan and the South China Sea. And so China's going to get angry at us. This is going to push us over the brink because our relations are already so bad and it's going to shut down all diplomatic talks between the U.S. and China. That's going to destabilize the U.S. and China relations, which will destabilize the entire Asia region, right, including the Middle East. And then that will draw Russia into the conflict to Draki against the United States to sort of destroy our leadership, which produces a great power war between the United States and Russia, which turns into an all-out nuclear holocaust as Iran joins in, and then everybody launches their nuclear weapons, right? And we all die, all because you wanted to put some people in Indonesia. <laughs> That's the debate round. Like, quick and dirty, right? They read some evidence and some cards from some hacks about that, but like, pretty much, Right? That's what the debate is. So the debate, we're, the debate devolves down to how many nuclear wars the other team causes. Right? So the affirmative says we need to put this base in Indonesia because Japan is getting a little antsy. That's causing conflict between them and China and that's disrupting their relationship. And now Japan and China are gonna go to war. That draws in both the US and Russia, which gets us to the great power war that then draws in Iran and now we're back to nuclear holocaust. Right? That's the affirmative version of the event. The event that I gave you the first time was the negative version of the event. And they keep doing that until one of them has one nuclear war over the other. <laughs> right? So at the end of the debate, 
whoever solves the most nuclear wars and causes the least nuclear wars <laughs> wins the debate. That's how you evaluate a debate room. Right? That's what traditional policy debate looks like. So when the black students started coming out of the urban debate leagues and filling in space in college policy debate, and they wanted to talk about systemic impacts, like right, things that are actually occurring, right, rather than your nebulous, we may have nuclear winter with Iran and Russia impact, which is unlikely to occur, Right? Let's talk about things like racial discrimination. Let's talk about homelessness. Let's talk about sexism. Let's talk about homophobia. Those are real impacts. People are dying in places around the country from pollution that the government is allowing. Like, let's talk about real people, that real things that are happening to real people. But when those black students first got to debate to make those arguments, the judging pool was like, but there's a nuclear war, though. <laughs> we all at risk. Y'all at risk, too, in a nuclear war. We gotta save everybody. Sorry, black people. Right? Sorry, poor people. Sorry, homeless. Right? That's how debate rounds were judged. And so part of what the Louisville team sort of institutes is not just a critique of, you know, nuclear war, these nuclear war claims are stupid, but that debaters themselves enjoy playing what sort of is like a military war game. Right? And that because they play it as a military war game, debate is training debaters themselves to not care about the loss of life, the loss of individual life. Right? So when they go out to be policymakers and they have choices to make between, oh, China's not going to like this policy, but this would be really good for Americans, what are they going to choose? China's not going to like this policy and it will have these potential consequences for American leadership internationally. So we can't help our own people because we worry China's going to have a bad reaction to it. That is the conflict, right, that Louisville sort of brings to the forefront. And they say, no, we, we refuse to allow this made-up impact claim of nuclear war that you've just discussed here to outweigh the fact that we have evidentiary proof that these structural impacts that we are talking about are happening right now. So our impact's real, your impact is made up, vote for the real impact, <laughs> right? And as they started, but it took them changing the form of debate to allow for new content in debate. And that's sort of what they did. They brought together this destabilizing of form and content in traditional debate to produce something new, interesting, and revolutionary for debate practice. So I was at a talk, a couple, this is, I think I'm going to end here so you all can ask questions. But I was at a talk um, maybe at a, about a month and a half ago in New York City, uh, invited to deliver a paper on a panel for a conference. The conference was paired with a debate round robin. And a round robin in debate tournaments just means that every team has to hit each other. And then you decide who's the top based on who has the most win-loss records. So they invited a group of black high school debaters who do this sort of black debate argument to come compete in a round robin at, uh, in New York City. And then the second day, those students would get to present a conference paper along with a bevy of very significant black academics and sort of demonstrate right, what debate teaches. And these are 16, 17, 18 year old students who are writing academic papers at the level of first year doctoral students. Right? And these are people, these are kids from like Compton, out the hood of the ATL, Chicago, the streets of Chicago. Right? We're not talking about kids who in private school somewhere with all the resources and parents with a whole lot of money. Right? So that what happened in that conference really for me I think is the most effective way of sort of trying to get you to understand the significance of what's happening in debate in terms of this sort of racialized revolution which is I'm the first generation of urban debate league students to graduate from high school college and with the PhD so I'm the doctor right but I had uh, a number of my students in this audience for this conference and so I had them stand up as I called them I was like can I get my high school debaters to stand up they stood up I said can I get my college debaters to stand up they stood up. I said, can I get my graduate debaters, right, graduate assistants who are coaches now, right, but who are coaching debate, can I get you to stand up? Can I get my newly minted PhDs who were debaters to stand up? And then they stood up. And when you had that, all of those people standing, there was about 30 people standing up. 
And what I have done over the past 10 or 12 years is encourage a feeder line from competitive debate to the PhD, right? My students are ready at 17 and 18 to be recruited into doctoral programs. They have the writing capacity. They have the research ability. They have the knowledge. And they have the understanding of high level critical theory that you could find difficult even teaching to undergrads. Right? My undergraduate debaters are already writing at publication level. Some of them are already published authors in journals with big scholars in black, in black studies. Right? So these students are playing no games. They have goals. And what I have built is a, co is a coalition of them, right? They have a cohort. So when they go to college, they don't go by themselves. When they go to graduate school, they're not going by themselves. They will never be in isolation from other smart thinkers who are also activists, who are engaged in a direct role for themselves of engaging in the black community and doing what needs to be done to help black people in the current circumstance that they find themselves in. So our former debaters are the heads of nonprofits. They are the heads of political action committees. They are lawyers. They are professors. They are teachers in high schools. They're teaching in freedom schools. They are doing any number of things, and we're just building a network, right? And they just spread now all across the country, right? Influence and conversation everywhere they go. So that's what debate has done and why I think it's so significant in what it is doing and what it could do potentially for the future. Thank you. So we have about 25 minutes for questions. So I'm going to open it up to the floor and we'll see where that leads us. Yes. So uh, I really think the production of voice is pretty powerful, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to explore that a little more. But I'm also thinking about the, the exchange that you had yesterday with the, the students, mm -hmm. um, because I see that in mass all across the country when I'm traveling, mm -hmm. the amount of anger, resentment, and patience of white people not taking ownership. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying younger people, because now it's not like, oh, we gave your father a pass. Mm -hmm. We're not giving you a pass. Mm -hmm. In the age of the internet, you know what's going on, there's mm -hmm. no excuse. So the example that you gave of how the debaters, even in something that sounds as innocuous as a debate mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. found ways to oppose structural racism. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that and how that looks. Because these are young people who have found a way to do that, who probably in other spaces will say, I'm not participating in this system. I'm not upholding racism, but mm -hmm. in their daily lives, it's so unconscious and so sublime that mm -hmm. it ends up being very conscious, very intentional. Mm -hmm. um, that is one of the, I think, the most difficult things to sort of do when you're teaching. And I teach across, I teach about race, but across racial categories, right? So I teach black students, I teach white students, I teach Asian students, Latino, et cetera. But one of the things that's most difficult is getting white students to um, view the world as it actually is, rather than as they have been taught it is, right? And white, white kids get taught that, you know, bad things don't just happen because to people, right? So, you know, if you're walking, if you're a good person, you're doing good things, right? Good things are going to happen to you. If you're smart, the university is going to let you in. If you are a good student, they're going to give you good grades, right? They live in that world, right? Where things are just about how good you are. It's about you as an individual, right? You can be an individual when you're a white person, right? But when you are not white, you no longer are allowed to be individual, right? You become representative of an entire group of people and then the stereotypes that are associated with those group of people you have to wear and then when you're out in the world you have to battle against those stereotypes so that when white people encounter you they are not made uncomfortable by you. So when white students walk around in the world they don't see those things because they have not been trained to see it. They don't even know that the world exists this way. And when things happen to show white kids, particularly this age group, right, college students, 
they've grown up in a very different world, right, in terms of racial diversity than say I did or that my parents did or that my grandparents did. So they actually think that they are really diverse people. Right? They think they like really engaging with other people. They're like, what are you talking about? I like soul food, right? I go, I, I like listen to hip hop, right? I like neo soul, right? I go to underground clubs and listen to reggae, right? They really think that that means that they live a more diverse reality. They really think that. Like and I voted for Obama. I voted for Obama, so I'm about sick of that one, right? <laughs> I voted for Obama, right? And then I'm not belittling your feelings, right? And I want the white students to hear me. I'm not belittling that experience. But what I'm telling you is that that experience has blinded you to the reality of race in America and that you benefit from it in ways that, we, that you, you can't even imagine. And so when something happens in your face, that's racial. That's why this Black Lives Matter thing, right, has gotten so big and there's so many white people who support Black Lives Matter because they are looking at the video footage, right, the video footage of black people being killed and they're like, that got you killed? And they're just like, and that's about race? We still there? Oh my God. Oh my God. It's real. It's real. Right? And that's why they have such an emotional reaction to it. Just why, like, why white people are so emotional about Trump's election. Mm -hmm. Right? I didn't cry because Trump got elected. Y'all didn't know that America was racist. <laughs> white people. Y'all didn't know that y'all had those racist people out there. Y'all didn't know that was real. Right? We all knew it was real. We're not surprised. Mm -hmm. This was not surprising. This is America. So, white students, you have to open your eyes and look what is happening in the world around you. Pay attention to the things that you are seeing. And don't write off race as the explanation because you don't want to believe that's true. Because that's what you do, right? When your black friend comes to you and says, this thing just happened to me, it was totally racist, your first inclination is to explain to them why it wasn't racist. That's the first thing you do. And then your black friend be looking at you like, see, that's why you're not on my team. You're not an ally. Every time I come to you and say something was racist, your response is, let me explain why that wasn't racist. But the reason white people do that is because they don't want to believe it's true. They don't want to believe that the violence of racism is gratuitous. It's gratuitous. It does not matter what you are doing. It does not matter how you are dressed. It doesn't matter what, how you wear your hair. It doesn't matter where you were educated. Because simply that your body is black, it opens you up to violence. Just because it's black. That's it. Being black in America is enough to get you killed. Being black in America is enough to mean that you're not going to make as much money as white people. It's enough to mean that your children are more likely to grow up in cities where they have asthma problems to do, that deal with the pollution. That the white people in your suburban neighborhood said, no, you can't bring your industry over here. And because poor black people have no political power, they cite them in their neighborhoods. So while you breathe in clean air at your rich, nice high school in the suburbs, People like me were in high schools with leftover books and not enough teachers and overcrowded classrooms. That is structural racism. So stop thinking you're going to see race because you know a frat boy that said th that called somebody a nigger. I don't care what that frat boy says. I don't care what comes out of his mouth. I'm concerned about the structure. The structure produce produces material consequences for black people that are very real. So open your eyes. Just look, you'll see it if you pay attention. If you just pay attention, you'll see it. Do some history reading. These people have taught you a history of America that is a lie because they have only wanted to tell you a version of the story. And I'm not talking about, yes, they tell you about slavery, they tell you about the Trail of Tears, right? But what they don't tell you that around the same time that we're trying to get that 1964 Civil Rights Act passed, the Congress is also passing a national highways bill which produced the suburbs,
created the urban ghettos and shuttle black people there and white people out and then decided to base resources on those locations at the same time that we're passing the Civil Rights Act. That is structural racism. When you look around at your neighborhood, when you go home and visit your parents and wonder why there are no black people there, part of what you should ask yourself is, will the real estate agent even show black people this neighborhood? That's structural racism. Right? That's the world you live in. So I'm not screaming at you to take responsibility because you are racist. That's, that's not even the level of conversation we're having. What we're talking about are the dynamics of the structure of our nation itself. That's what I'm talking about, right? Not your personal feelings, right? I may personally not like you. I may personally not like how you live your life, but you get to live it that way. And I'm not gonna make the structure so that you cannot or that you have to face consequences because of those choices, right? And what we're talking about isn't a choice, right? We can't change our skin color. I mean, many have tried, right? That's some history for you, right? That's some history to know. Right? That black people attempted all kinds of bleaching products to lighten their skin so they would be more palatable to, to white people. Just like the history of black women straightening their hair is about attempting to appear more like white women. Right? That's not an accusation I'm making right now. We're just talking about the history, how we got where we are. Right? That politics of respectability, perform yourself in appropriate ways so white people will treat you well. And then what black people started to realize is you can perform yourself in that way, but that does not make you any less in danger, right? You are still in danger, right? I am still afraid of the police, right? I told the last lecture group, right, I will live stream myself if I'm pulled over by the cops. And as I'm in that live stream, I will tell the live stream, I have no weapons. There are no drugs in my car. If they arrest me, I did not kill myself in police custody because I could be Sandra Bland, right? And somebody could be calling my mother and telling her that I died in police custody by committing suicide. I want the world to know I'm a happy girl. I'm a happy girl. I didn't kill myself in police custody. But that is the world we live in. And I grew up in inner city Atlanta, so that fear of the police is almost natural, right? It is that thing that keeps you safe, right? my first inclination is not to want to call the cops in an emergency. Because even when the cops are being called to come help black people, they have often still engaged in brutal practices towards the black people they were there to help. Numerous black people have been shot because someone called the police for help, not to report a crime. So that's the world we live in and I want you, so I, I know, and I'm talking to the white students in particular here, I know this is frustrating. Right? I know it's frustrating because it requires you to see yourself as responsible, not for the history of it all. Right? You can't take responsibility for an entire history of decisions that were not yours. But you are responsible for the privilege you walk around with. And you are responsible how that privilege gets used. And you are responsible for paying attention to the ways that the structure will privilege you over others and that you accept you accept it. That's where you have to start thinking. Don't walk away from here feeling, feeling sad or angry or like guilty. That's what the word I'm looking for. Don't walk away feeling guilty because your guilt is not helpful. Guiltiness will make you non-active. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't want you to feel guilty. This is not about guilt. It's about knowledge. It's about understanding that you have to strategically engage in the civil society and in the state in a way that is well aware that anti-blackness is real and that it has very serious material consequences and that violence is gratuitous for black people in our society because you are a silent majority. They can kill us because you don't care. That's why they get away with it. They can murder us because you don't care. When the white kids start to care, when you start putting your bodies in between black bodies and police bullets, because they're not going to shoot you en masse, that's when you become 
an accomplice and not just an ally. And that accomplice word means that you fundamentally understand that you are as invested in creating this change as the black people whose real bodies are on the line. Until you're ready to put your body on the line with us as we are trying to fight for a world that values black life, you are a part of the problem because you are that silent majority, that group that does not care. And because you don't care, they don't have to legislate. They don't have to change anything. You feel safe. That safety is a privilege. And one you're not even willing to admit is a privilege. And one you are not willing to fight for every other human being to have. We should all be safe. Mm -hmm. And your safety is built on me not being safe. That's how you stay safe. Because they don't over patrol your neighborhoods. Because they're over patrolling mine. That's how you stay safe. So your life. Your safety exists on the backs of people of color and poor people who functionally are sacrificing their lives to sustain a system of living that benefits white people. And that's where we are. That's just honest talk. You know what I mean? Don't walk away feeling guilty. Walk away being smart. Think strategically. Watch what's happening. See it and don't be afraid to speak up. Because we get tired. I can't speak up every time. I can't fight the fight every time. We got to trade. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's me. Right? So you can do a lot. Don't walk away feeling like there's nothing you can do. Don't walk away feeling like guilty. That's not what this is about. Right? We have a whole society to rebuild. Because global warming is real. <laughs> the apocalypse is coming. Like for real. Right? The apocalypse is coming and it's going to start happening more quickly. The impacts will be felt more swiftly. Like, it's about to get really real. So given that we know right, that this level of conflict is coming for humanity, resource wars, mm -hmm. conflicts over water, conflicts over food, the American breadbasket is drying out. Right? What I'm telling you, these impacts are real and they are coming. And it will debilitate into so much ugliness if we don't figure out how to work together now. We will fight across race lines for resources. And we will kill each other for it. Unless we decide to do something different. That's why I have hope in millennials in a lot of ways. Because millennials are, millennials are feeling, figuring out how to create coalitions across difference in a way that I've not seen before. Whether it's, you know, Somali Muslims to, um, you know, African Americans in the streets of Chicago to feminist groups, et cetera, et cetera, Latino groups, right? We're just watching this wave of engagement amongst your age group. So if any of this is something that we're going to be able to resolve or we're going to stop or we're going to figure out how to even start to invest in it or to figure out what to do about it, it's going to come from y'all. So don't, don't walk away feeling guilty. We have many things to do. You have work to do. Go do that work. Okay? Don't be guilty. Go do the work. All right. Anything else? We probably have like eight minutes, I think, till 6.30, 5.30. Yeah. I'm still on ATL time on my computer. <laughs> Anybody else? I've given you a lot to think about, I know. Yes. Yeah. As you're talking about sort of systemic problems, of course, it's hard to watch the country push back so strongly against those. Mm -hmm. It's happening in lots of different ways. The one that kind of comes to mind most quickly is the Dow Jones program. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which our education system is under attack and it's fundamental, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I mean, I, that's an excellent example of the ways in which um, the very sort of core values of our, you know, system of American democracy culture are sort of being, are under attack in a lot of ways. This education situation, I think, um, is going to produce more consequences rather than producing benefits. So, for example, I, I would suspect that we'll see more dropouts. Um, amongst inner city populations of color 
um, one of the other things just that so people know um, charter schools are often application based right and so you apply to be admitted to a charter school and then they look at your application and they decide based on your application whether or not to admit you so when if we move to a like you know very much so full charter school system right what's going to end up happening is we're going to have to keep some public schools because those charter schools are not going to let students in that don't test at a certain level because if your students don't test at a certain level coming in they'll drive down the average scores for the school and that has problems for like things like resources right so it's not that like black kids won't have access to education it's that we will only take the best of the best and give them education and those people who have very few advocates for themselves right people who can advocate for them um, students who have lower test scores students who have disabilities etc they're going to get warehoused in public institutions that public education institutions that mimic jail right that's where we're headed um, and it's going to be more of students in that situation than I think we realize. So I don't know what the future is going to hold for us, but I do know that we are walking down some very dangerous paths right now. Um, oh, also, one other thing, just thinking about this schooling education thing, also one thing that I want to sort of share with you all. When we're thinking about, um, you know, these black male shooters, not this guy just in Cleveland recently, but the, say for example, the guy who shot the police officers in Dallas, for example, um, I think we're on the verge of seeing more of that. Um, I think that as, as the situation worsens economically, materially for people, that we will see an uptick in political violence because there is politics on the brain right now. Um, and so I do foresee that we will see more homegrown American black terrorists who are not joining, like, it's not like they're trying to join Islam or anything, right? They're not Muslim. They're not trying to join, like, ISIS, right? They're just people who actually are trained by the U.S. military in things like explosives and guns. And... They fundamentally, pe black people are sort of getting to the understanding, particularly millennials, people who are my age, a little younger, those involved in politics, particularly radical kind of politics, activism. Those people sort of fundamentally realize that black life doesn't matter. That's why the movement for black lives was important, right? You have to say black lives matter. And the reason we, they're saying that is because black lives don't matter, right? Is that black life has no value in American society. Right, stopping our deaths or preventing our deaths is not a value for American society. So, given that that's the case, the more of Black America, right, that moves into poverty and working classness, the more of Black young America that's unable to get jobs or be correctly educated in a way to participate in the American economic system, the more we see that happen, the more likely we are to watch those those people turn to violent revolutionary tactics right to affect the US government so I'm hoping we're not anywhere near there but we are watching the breakdown of civilization before our eyes in case you didn't recognize that that's what's happening right climate change in particular is going to have some incredibly negative effects on the ability for us to sustain current American life right harsh harsh times are ahead and once those times start to hit, we will turn on each other. And I do think that that turning on each other is going to be violent. So, there you go. <laughs> Not that we should be depressed about these things. Sometimes things have to be broken in order for you to build something new. And we may just be in that time. America's lasted a long time as a nation. You know what I mean? As has places like Britain, like the current sort of flow of civilization right has already outlasted its time period that's all I'm saying to you right um, just based on the history of humankind right civilizations will collapse and we are really just think we're in that moment of a major epoch right of change worldwide change not just America right we're at that edge of a major epoch we're going to start to see some fundamental cracks and disturbances in the foundations of civilization and we will find ourselves we're gonna lose a lot of people you know what I mean we're gonna lose a lot of people in the process right starvation I'm not even talking about violence necessary right but starvation famine things like that that's just gonna happen 
So that's what we need to be thinking about, right? Is that's why we need to be planning together for the future. We need to stop all of this conflict we have with each other, right? You know, the world is at risk. And we mad because, you know, I don't even know why we mad at each other. Really. You know, but that anger, those conflicts, that's how people keep getting rich and snowing us on what we really need to be paying attention to, which is that our environment is dying and it can no longer sustain the number of humans on the planet. Right? That's real. But we can't resolve that issue because we're fighting over stupid stuff like racism and gender and sexuality. Why are we fighting about these things? Right? When the big thing is on the horizon, it's like an asteroid flying at us and like we need to be paying attention to dealing with it. And we over here arguing with each other. Asteroids still coming. Right? So that's why you have to do this work. Right? It's not just like, oh, kumbaya, we should all love each other. Right? We should love each other in, a, in the world of my own spiritual goddess making. Right? We would love each other. It would be kumbaya. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the reality of where the world is going and what's happening right, to our societies. And that we've got to come together to figure out how to resolve those issues. Which means that we have to have some honest conversations. Right? That's why I'm as honest as I am when I'm talking about race to students. Right? You've got to have somebody who's willing to speak to you honestly. And not pussyfoot around it. Right? So that you hear it, get some truthiness. Okay, so that's what we're doing, right? So I want you to go out and talk about this conversation with your people. Oh, I saw this great speaker. She said this thing, <laughs> right? For white people, you can start the conversation with you started with this. You can go tell your other white friends, right? Like I saw this speaker, and she said white people do not deserve futurity. <laughs> that's how you start the conversation. She said white people should die. No, that's not what she said. <laughs> that's not what she said. She wants white people to question whether or not they deserve futurity. Do you deserve to live as a people, not as an individual, right? As an individual, I got love for you. I want you to be here, right? But as a people with what you have produced in the world, do you deserve to live? Those are the kinds of questions white people got to start asking themselves because y'all are too convinced that you deserve everything you have. <laughs> That's the assumption that the world has handed to you, that you deserve everything you have. And I want you to question whether or not you deserve it. Not because you're not a cool person, but because of the way that society functions, how whiteness functions as a part of our society, what it produces politically, economically, environmentally. Right? And once you start to ask yourself those questions, then you're like, oh my God, our consumption practices are horrific for the environment. We have set up horrible political systems and ways of engaging politically. We have caused great harm. We always talking about why we worried about other countries coming for us, but we kill people indiscriminately in other nations. With no concern, collateral damage. We ain't find no wars on American soil. Okay? That's what I need you to go home and be thinking. Because I need you to go home and do some work. Right? I need you to go home and think about the world you live in. And when you do, you will be so much more excited about the world because you will see it for what it is. And you will see your place in it. And then what you can be doing about it. And that will give you some purpose. I often think that white kids don't have purpose. Not like you have job purpose, right? But I mean serious spiritual life purpose, right? Which isn't about which job you, te you, ha you take, right? But about how you plan on being in the world as a human, right? This is what I'm trying to grow for you. Right? How you're going to be in the world as a human. All right. All right. We're out of time. Thank you all for coming.